Thank you for inviting um, all of uh, the Henry Ford Health System um, to visit you today. We were so, so honored to be part of this um, uh, meeting. And as I told the folks at my table, really impressed with the um, whole state conference and the state process for encouraging um, uh, new people to the Baldridge journey and also the recognition throughout um, the four-step process. So uh, kudos to all of you. Um, I am uh, here from Henry Ford to talk about our journey and our the, basically the, the key times or turning points that really helped uh, propel us. Um, further each year. Our journey was a seven-year journey, so um, it's, it's encouraging to folks who have applied multiple times to hear from us because we did not, um, this did not come easily to us throughout the, the time. Um, and I will allow for Q&A at the end to make sure you have a chance to ask specific questions that I might not be addressing. So people know that Henry Ford started us. Um, Henry Ford the man started us, and we were one of his innovations. Um, even back in 1915, when we opened our doors, um, Henry Ford Hospital did things quite differently from a lot of other hospitals. In fact, Henry Ford visited um, Johns Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic when he was forming the hospital because he really liked the idea of an employee group practice. And that was very radical uh, back in 1915 and very, very different for Detroit. In fact, our physicians weren't even allowed to be part of um, the medical society in uh, the Wayne County area because they thought that physicians who were employed were a different kind of animal that they didn't want um, part of their group. Uh, so Henry um, laid a wonderful foundation for us. And as a private not-for-profit, we're not owned by the Ford family or Ford Motor Company. A lot of people get confused by that. But we are still represented on our board of trustees by Ford family members, including um, Henry Ford's uh, great-great-grandson, Bill Ford Jr., of the uh, Ford Motor Company. Just a real quick overview of who we are. So we have four uh, hospitals across Southeast Michigan, one of them being the original Henry Ford Hospital, which is an academic medical center. We have a couple behavioral health institutions and an inpatient rehab hospital. As I mentioned, our medical group, um, which was started um, nearly 100 years ago, is comprised of about 1,200 physicians and researchers. And it's still a group practice model. However, over the years, as we've acquired other hospitals, we also have a very large contingent of private practice physicians. And both um, MD and osteopathic training programs uh, that are widely recognized. What makes us um, a little unique for um, the country is that we um, have a health plan that's part of integrated into our health system. And when we applied for the Baldridge Award, it was as a system. So all the components um, were included. We, didn't, we, we thought long and hard and decided not to do it as a single hospital, but that if we were an integrated health system, we would be applying as a system. Um, like most health systems, we have the full range of pre- and post-acute services, um, and including some retail arms, such as um, a whole line of vision centers um, that uh, offer glasses and contact lenses, and um, a robust retail pharmacy program. We have more than 23,000 employees, so um, you'll hear me talking about uh, our employees as ambassadors, and we rely on them quite a bit um, as a, a communication arm of the organization. Um, we have a very large um, number of admissions, ED visits, surgeries, and $3.2 million, $3 million office visits uh, or ambulatory visits. So I mentioned it was seven years of learning, and it should say seven years of learning and improving, because during this time we made some dramatic changes that I'll be, I'll be walking you through. Um, but it really started in 2003 when Nancy Schlichten was named CEO of Henry Ford. Um, she had been an executive vice president um, for a few years prior to that, and the amount of change that the system has gone through um, for the past decade has been really significant. When I joined in 2001, we were really struggling as a health system. We had lost $100 million. And I think that's a really important point, that the changes we made over the decade um, weren't just 
um, minor changes that got us to the point of um, being a recipient of the Baldridge Award, they were significant changes that um, uh, could be easily qualified as transformational, um, a major turnaround. So to just give you an overview of the journey, um, in around 2004, Nancy said, you know, um, I've been studying the Baldridge framework. I've been looking into it, talking to other CEOs who had um, received the award, and this is something I want to do. And it wasn't, um, she said at the time, to receive any kind of recognition or award. It was for us to improve as an organization. However, we knew in the back of her mind she wanted to receive the award someday, so there was a little added extra pressure. Um, we began by really doing significant self-assessments. And for those of you who are early on in your journey, I really recommend this. Um, we did our own assessment. And at Henry Ford, we tend to be harder on ourselves than anyone else. And so we really scored ourselves, um, I think, very realistically. And it was very low. Um, and we had a consultant come in and uh, help us understand um, our, our um, whole framework, what was, what was strong, what really needed significant improvement. And they helped introduce us to others across the country. And so we had people that won the award from healthcare, from outside the healthcare industry, come and talk to us. The company we used was Kate Goonan and Associates. And um, they were instrumental in really um, helping us learn and, and understand along the way. In 2007, 2007 was the first year we applied for both the state award and the national award. And um, as I mentioned earlier, made the very um, important decision of applying as a system. It would have been way easier to apply as one business unit or one hospital. But um, I, I think Nancy really believed that, that if we were truly an integrated delivery system, why would we want to hold just one piece of it out there as doing things right? And so that made the journey more challenging, but um, in the end, way more satisfying. So that first year we applied, um, we were very fortunate to get a site visit by the state, and actually, in the end, won the Michigan Quality Council um, Leadership Award. We were really pleased to receive that award, um, and we're kind of surprised that you know we didn't even get a site visit at the national level. Um, but then we got the feedback report, and then really understood that we didn't deserve a site visit, and we had a lot of improving um, uh, to to um, go go forward. One of the things that I think is so important is it's not just the feedback report that guides you and helps you understand how to improve, but it's writing the application too. And um, I'll probably mention that later, but we had as much learning from writing and answering the difficult questions um, than we had um, in going through the feedback report and saying, OK, here's what we have to work on, and here's what we have to focus on. So in 2008 and in 2009 and 2010, we kept um, applying, learning, and improving. And I say that um, all in one sentence because it was being done simultaneously. Um, rather than pause and take a feedback report and take a few years and then apply again, um, Nan Nancy was, was on a real-time track for improvement. And that was very motivating. I mean, you really got that feedback report and you knew you had to consistently work on getting better because you certainly didn't want to apply again and have that same, those same OFIs. You wanted to, to see that improvement in real time. It's also very hard to do it that way. And those of you who have been applying know that, especially if you do consecutive years. Um, you're along two parallel tracks. But if you really embrace it as this is your work, and that was something that we really had to um, embrace as a leadership team. It couldn't be, this is the Baldridge work, and this is the other work. And I think that was something that a lot of us, a lot of us said at first, oh my god, how am I supposed to do all these uh, OFI work with Baldridge when I have this work over here? It should be the same work. And I think that was, that was probably a turning point that I don't even mention, but a, a very important lesson. So we, during this time, we were getting examiner's training. 
We had 20 plus examiners at both the Michigan and national level. And just, uh, I'll be walking through what some of those real improvements were we were making. Finally, fifth application was submitted and we were thrilled to have a site visit. And a lot of us thought, you know, this is just another piece of our learning, this site visit. Um, I don't think I don't think all of us thought that you know we would um, actually receive the award the first time after a site visit. So we were delighted when we got the call um, in November on the 21st, which if Nancy were here, she would tell you it was her birthday, and it was the best present that she could get. Um, and then we still. Um, notice, Mark, that that feedback report came December 14th, and we were right back at it, learning from the feedback report and trying to further improve. So creation of the pillars. We call that turning point number one, and this is a very basic thing. I, I'm, I'm sure many, many organizations have pillars or something similar, but why it was a turning point for us is that from a strategic planning standpoint, we were finally getting everybody on the same page in the system. And when you have um, a system as large as ours, uh, and, and we're four and a half billion dollar health system, many business units, everybody was doing strategic planning a little differently. And these pillars served as um, the overarching categories of where we would be building our strategic plan from. So we have specific strategic objectives under each one of these. And from the objectives, we have specific strategic initiatives. And we adopted that Baldridge language because um, Prior to that, everybody had different words, and was it a goal you were working on, and an objective, and was there an action plan attached to it? Nobody was talking the same language, so we really promote. It doesn't have to be what the Baldridge um, framework calls for, but it has to be a consistent language that everybody in the organization is familiar with and comfortable with and using. That consistency of the framework is really important. So we wrapped the seven pillars with a ribbon that we called the Henry Ford Experience. And that was important to us because again, we are trying for that consistent experience no matter where you enter the health system. It could be an ambulatory center, it could be a hospital, it could be one of the um, optical offices. It doesn't matter, it has to be a consistency uh, from the quality standpoint, from the service standpoint, um, along with everything else. So that experience was very important. The foundation um, actually has changed as we have um, come along. We didn't usually, when we first designed this, we did not have our core competencies. But as we began, as we began um, leveraging those core competencies more and better developing our Baldridge framework, we said, you know, those competencies are foundational to our whole system. They should be on there. And the organizational framework you'll see is actually the categories of Baldridge. That wasn't originally on there, but it became so integrated with who we are and what we do, we actually changed the, the pillar framework as we went along. Um, I, I basically went over all of the things of, on this slide except to say that the mission and vision are supported equally by the seven pillars. And we say that um, because we think that those seven pillars all in their own right are critically important to our future and to operating our system. But we purposely put the people pillar first, and that is because we feel that if we are engaging our team members and they feel so um, a, a part of the organization and embrace the health system, that all of the other pillars are gonna be easier to um, fulfill the goals that we have listed under there. So the people pillar was strategically put first. Finance was strategically put last, and our CFO would even agree with that because he's saying if you do all of those things correctly, then uh, foundationally you're gonna be successful from a, from a financial standpoint. Turning point number two, receiving the Michigan Quality Council Leadership Award. It wasn't because um, we got an award that was the turning point. It was, again, all of the learning from it. Um, the site visit we received um, was 
probably a, a bit of a shock, the prep work you had to do in terms of the number of things you had to pull, the number of outcomes you had to demonstrate. But it was such great learning for when we had the site visit from the national organization, because they require a lot more. And so being able to um, understand what was going to be requested and, um, and, and really understand what the examiners were looking for and, um, and, and helping them understand who you are was very, very helpful. Um, but it was also good from the standpoint that when we didn't receive the national award, it made it very clear that there was going to be a big difference between receiving those two and that we weren't going to be um, uh, congratulating ourselves or patting ourselves on the back for very long. I think we maybe gave ourselves 24 hours and then it was right back at it. And so that was, that was an important learning as well. The Performance Council, which is our overall leadership team, and our new leadership processes were another turning point. And I have to say, we, um, when we were first asked to describe our leadership system, um, we really struggled with that. No one was really answering it the same way. It was probably because we didn't have a um, very clear picture of our leadership system. So those of you who are working on this, um, you know, creating a picture of the leadership system, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking literally like a diagram of how you do things will help you as you see where your gaps are. Um, we did have one thing that everybody was consistent about and that was that we, and the way our leadership system was currently operating, um, we were um, uh, known as 100 points of veto when people had ideas or um, uh, certain programs or, or new initiatives that they wanted approved. It wasn't really clear where they go or if they had to go to five groups to get approval or one group. There was not that clear, um, consistent way um, to go about things. Another thing about our leadership system was that we had many groups with overlapping responsibilities. And so really defining what the objectives are for each leadership group you have and how they relate to one another really critical for people to understand um, in the organization how your system operates. So we depicted our, our leadership system. And again, this evolved over time. Just because um, we, we drew it one way doesn't mean we weren't going to improve and therefore change as we went along. And so we incorporated in this our customers right in the middle. And um, that, was, that was very important. I mean, let's, let's be very basic and say, who are those customers and how should we be developing our leadership system around those customers? Um, our plan, do, check, act we uh, made on the uh, broad circle, and we included the pillars, and we included um, uh, our um, uh, core competencies, because again, they were a foundation to our leadership system. Um, and then finally, of course, our vision. Where did we want to be? Because the leaders should be keeping that vision front and center um, as we moved along. So this was the uh, end result of the leadership system, which really helped clarify for us quite a bit. So that's when we developed the leadership organization that we have today called Performance Council. And Performance Council includes the CEOs of each of our business units, as well as the corporate vice presidents of all of the key um, support service areas for the system. There hadn't been a group that was really exactly like that prior. So there was a group of corporate VPs me meeting, and then there was a group of CEOs meeting. And it, it was an, an not... Um, a clear decision-making organization. So once we had that in place, we started defining, so what is this group going to do? And um, the strategic planning process was at the top of the list. Let's look at those pillars and let's agree to what the strategic objectives are, what do we want to achieve in each one of those pillars. And then the business units could go about saying, OK, how am I going to help to drive that strategic objective? And they would uh, come up with each business unit strategic plan that had specific strategic initiatives to further that specific objective. And then action plans and um, uh, target outcomes to help achieve those goals. It, it sounds like it's very simple, but when you have a 
a system that's very large and complex, and even if you're not that large and complex, spelling it out and making it as clear as day is so helpful to um, getting everybody on the same page. The thing that we had not been doing very well at all was um, having very specific targets that were visited on a frequent basis versus biannually and then an or semiannually and then annually. Now every month we're looking at our dashboard and that is allowing us to make real time changes because if you do it six months down the road and you see that your volumes are dropping in ambulatory, really hard to change things around before the year is up. So this was allowing um, us to be very clear about who was looking at what metrics and what we were going to do about it. So one of the things that we also noted in, among our OFIs was that we were really good at looking to the future to uh, proactively decide what strategies we wanted to do. But we weren't looking proactively at the risks. And so we developed an enterprise risk council. And their whole um, mission is to really look at what risks there are to the system and mitigate those risks or eliminate them altogether. Um, and the work that group has done has been very impressive and I'll give an example. One of the risks that was um, initially identified was um, th with our IT systems and that people had mobile devices and laptops but there wasn't, um, they weren't protected. There wasn't, our devices were, would be easily, well, if, if, if stolen, easily um, uh, the material or the confidential information could be easily pulled by whoever, whoever wanted it. With HIPAA and with other um, uh, regulations, we knew that that was a huge risk to the health system. So we had all, um, all kinds of fun with this and um, had people bring in their devices and, um, and sort of like in hosting little parties where people brought in their devices, we um, uh, made sure that they were encrypted and we achieved in a very short time um, w what we believe is 100% uh, encrypted devices, people no longer using their own personal devices to put patient, uh, confidential patient information. So that was just one example, but really important to us achieving um, uh, or mitigating the risk, which was the goal of this group. Significantly improving strategic planning and measurement, another major turning point for us. Um, our strategic planning process, again, I don't think any of us, when we originally were filling out the um, Baldridge application, would have answered this quite the same way. Um, we had different processes in the different business units to go about it. So putting this on paper and talking about how we were going to um, use certain language and then own the performance targets. Because one of our OFIs was very few people really know and understand the performance targets versus really aligning your workforce with them. Those of you um, who uh, uh, are familiar with a program called Success Factors um, will know what I mean when I say if you have a program that allows your performance plans to be done online, you can cascade goals from leadership to your employees. This is a great way of helping align um, the strategic priorities of the organization and the targets, what your outcomes are. So once we, um, once we had success factors, we were able to do that line of sight from um, Nancy Schlichting and the senior leadership team down to um, the, the uh, nurses and the frontline folks on what the objectives are. And then, of course, um, how you measure to achieve the target might differ a little bit based upon that individual's role, but you're all following the same um, uh, strategic imperatives that the organization has. So aligning that was very important. Then the other part was aligning the strategic planning and the budgeting process. Um, one, one of our um, major improvements was, you know, we would, we would do strategic planning and we would have all these aspirational goals in the plan and then the real life budget would come along and there was no alignment. So getting those two really crisply, crisply aligned was very, very important. 
we also formed a new metrics committee, and the metrics committee was led by the CFO and the head of strategic planning. Um, and, and those two worked very, very closely together to help um, really understand and provide oversight and expertise to what we were going to measure and uh, what the dashboards were going um, to, to display. And and also pushed for a real transparency in our system, where these dashboards would be um, available on our intranet, our, um, our employee site, so that anybody could look at any time and see how we were doing. These were important things that we didn't have previously. There wasn't that transparency, especially between business units. So now, you had um, a complete understanding, if you were in the hospital, of how the health plan was doing, and vice versa. So that was very, very helpful. Um, example very similar to uh, a lot of organizations of what our um, performance council looks like. The dashboard um, uh, looks at current targets and, and um, uh, has the red, yellow, green methodology of saying whether you're on target or not. And we don't spend a lot of time, probably any time on the green, a little time on the yellow, but where our performance council takes the deep dive is on the red alerts. And we take it down to the initiatives. Um, so I told you we have strategic objectives, strategic initiatives. We take it to the initiative level because you might um, you might be on um, doing really well in terms of. Um, an initiative and or think you're doing really well and put a green with initiative because you know I'm on track with what I said I was going to do when but the metrics aren't showing that it's going to be impacting so you we really take a look at this level and say you know is the action plan right is the initiative right and do we need to change what we're doing and is, and is support needed for performance council? That last column is really important because now we were talking among one another and saying, you know what, Rose, I really need your help and support on this. And that was very helpful as well. Another thing we did is um, on our performance plans, we put an entire section for leaders that um, were the competencies in uh, the Baldridge framework on strategic planning, on leadership, um, on um, uh, outcomes. And 40% of leader evaluations are tied to those standards. And then we have similar ones for staff. Again, that line of sight, really important and a big change for us. Also, aligning incentives with organizational goals. Originally, we had something called a group performance award or a GPA for all of our employees. We only based it when we started it out on finances. That doesn't really give a good message. We're not basing it on patient satisfaction. We're not basing it on quality. So we've changed the incentives to really align with the strategic goals of the organization. Turning point number five, leveraging our competencies to tell a compelling story. That was one of the things our consultants really brought to the table. They said we were pretty lousy at telling our story. We had really good things to share, and we weren't doing a good job at sharing. And I'll give a few examples. So our innovations. Um, we have a real culture of entrepreneurism within Henry Ford Health System. And it's not just in facility design, although facility design is one of them. And those of you who've been to our website or even visited Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital, it was a hospital built on green space so we could do um, really start from scratch with what we wanted to build. And it, when people walk in it, they, they think they're in a high-end mall. That's what I hear most often. It's beautiful. It has um, views of either um, our pond or um, our wetlands, no matter what private room you're in. Um, the lobby is a retail area that has a uh, beautiful um, wellness center uh, called Vita, where you can get um, alternative therapies or massage. We have um, uh, a retail store called Live Well, and uh, it sounds exactly like uh, it, the, the words. It's products to help you live a, a better, healthier life. But what was neat is from the beginning, the vision was to create um, a center for well-being, a center for community well-being. And so there's areas in the hospital where people come just to visit and hang out with their friends. And that seems really strange, but there are card, uh, there are women who go, come to the atrium to play cards. And in the atrium, there's a tea kiosk. And they have tea and they talk, and it starts building 
and engaging consumers who might not even be patients yet in your campus. And it's been just a, a really uh, wonderful thing. We have a demonstration kitchen where we have people come in and learn how to cook healthier food. And we have disease specific um, instructions. So if someone is diabetic, we teach how to cook for that. Um, so it's a very much a community center for well being. And we're taking the best practices from there and we're transferring them throughout um, our health system. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not just facilities. It's things like hand washing. Um, we, uh, I, I believe the video is in the breakout session I'm going to be sharing later today. But we wanted to teach people, you know, really something really basic. It's really important to wash your hands. That is such a boring message. So we sent out um, an email to all the workforce and said, if you can come up with a script for a good video, we'll produce that video. So we had many, many people uh, submit scripts, and the top three scripts were turned into videos so our employees could vote on which video they found the most compelling to spread that word. And um, the one that won is uh, from the Beatles uh, song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. It's I Want to Wash My Hands. And the CEO of one of the hospitals and the chief quality officer for the system are the actors in it with the CEO um, wearing a Beatles wig and looking sort of like Paul McCartney. And this chief quality officer being his security guard as women go around screaming after them. So it's, uh, it's very entertaining. But that's that, that culture of really trying to um, go about things in a very innovative way is not just in one area, but is really throughout the system. And we really encourage everyone to get involved. And another great example is our chairman of surgery really was frustrated that he couldn't get quality um, uh, key messages out to his surgeons. So he and a couple of people really created something called ORTV. And so you, when you stand in front of um, a wall where you wash your hands for several minutes, now you see a TV screen. And the screen is giving you whatever messages we feel we need to get to you. Again, um, nothing. I have nothing to do with it. I'm in charge of marketing and PR. Nothing to do with the development of ORTV. Um, and that sense of entrepreneurism really helps drive uh, a lot of what we do. Uh, I mentioned West Bloomfield, and I, I, I should mention that the innovations developed in those private rooms, we then built, at, around the same time we were building West Bloomfield, at our downtown hospital, we added two floors to a new wing and equipped them exactly the same way that we did West Bloomfield. So learning from what we did um, and taking it to our urban academic medical center um, was just really something that boosted the folks there because they were getting the same um, a new feeling and, and quality uh, surroundings that we were doing at a brand new hospital. Care coordination is another core competency. And one of the things that we did that, that um, IHI, among others, really took a hard look at was we were defining harm. Um, and our chief quality officer's goal was to show that we could reduce harm, not just in one factor or one, you know, reducing infections uh, post-op or um, uh, getting people off ventilators quickly, but they put a formula together that would, was going to measure overall harm based upon these very sound um, IHI approved um, uh, indicators. And we were able to um, uh, spread our no harm campaign across our system. And you'll see some metrics in a few minutes. But um, the care coordination that it took to, to do the No Harm campaign it was really one of the things we, we, got, to, um, we got better at telling that story um, in our application. The Henry Ford Physician Network is another great example. We took privates and our medical group, which didn't always um, collaborate well together, and we formed the Physician Network, which we call a precursor to an ACO. And we are doing all of the right things in terms of integration, clinical integration, in order to show that um, we're not only improving quality, but we're reducing costs, and then uh, sharing those um, uh, cost savings with the 
the people that are part of the network. So again, um, really looking at ways to coordinate better. HAP allows us to do it tremendously well. Um, HAP, our, our, our health plan, has worked with us to um, innovate programs like prescription. We were one of the first in the country to do e-prescribe and show the uh, number of um, interventions that we were able to do to um, uh, improve um, people's outcomes by uh, catching the fact that um, there were two drugs they were prescribed that um, would, would not mix well together. So those kinds of things where e-prescribe e really were a hallmark. And then we went out and we taught others how to do it. And I'm talking others, competitor others. HAP went out and taught um, many of the health systems that are in their network um, how to get on e-prescribe. And again, that, that, that shared, shared learning for the overall uh, betterment of the community, the medical community, was really important to what we did. We also feel that as a major employer, one of the top in um, the state of Michigan is we need to be an economic engine and we need to care about the community where we reside. So Henry Ford Hospital is in a section of Detroit called Midtown and we collaborate with others in Midtown to really improve the area where we work. And our, our goal is to make Midtown a place where people not only come in from the suburbs, uh, to work, but they want to play in, they want to shop in, and they want to live in. So along with one of our competitors, um, Detroit Medical Center, and Wayne State University, one of our partners, we um, came up with Live Midtown. And Live Midtown is grant funded, although all three of us donate money as well into it. And what, it, uh, what Live Midtown is, is we uh, open up to any employee who is willing to move into Libtown, li to Midtown, we give them $25,000 toward buying a home. We give them $5,000 toward renovating a home that they already have in Midtown. And um, we give $2,000 toward leasing an apartment if they're going to lease an apartment for the first time. You wouldn't believe how well that's been received. And again, we couldn't do this without um, collaboration with partners and the funding agencies who are trying to boost up Detroit. This has gone so well that the downtown, three of the major companies downtown have d done a um, live downtown and we're seeing more and more pop up. So very important. Another thing we've done is we've um, acquired 300 acres across the street from Henry Ford Hospital. And we not only want to use those acres to develop um, new uh, components of our medical campus, but we want to partner with developers to have housing, retail, office space. And we have our, uh, our first um, company moving in this year. We just are receiving the approvals from City Council on rezoning. And it's going to be um, a distribution, a medical distribution vendor of ours. So we're really trying to attract those who are our partners um, to develop Midtown as well. We have many community health collaboratives. We know that attacking the problems of obesity, childhood obesity, and infant mortality, we can't do on our own. So our chief wellness officer, who used to be the um, state's Surgeon General, she was Michigan's first Surgeon General, um, chairs a childhood obesity task force and a infant mortality task force and is doing great work in trying to solve some of these big problems along with our competitors, um, funding agencies, and others. We have many academic collaboratives. Um, one that I'll just mention, uh, again, to show the kind of um, partnering we're doing, is we partner with a high school and a community college to start an early college high school. Um, and, that, and it is specifically dedicated toward medical professions. So we take um, students that are um, potentially at risk um, for uh, dropping out, maybe you know C-type C students, and those interested in medical careers, they're able to join this high school, and they go one extra year, it's a uh, five-year instead of four-year, and they're able to walk out with um, a degree as a medical assistant or um, one of the entry-level uh, positions in healthcare. Again, very, uh, very innovative way of collaborating. And then on leadership engage engagement, our leaders really do put, um, uh, really walk the talk. Um, Nancy Schlichting, our CEO, is head of the Chamber of Commerce. And um, 
Bob Riney, our president, heads the Detroit Convention and Visitors Bureau. So we really um, uh, encourage um, our leaders to get involved in the community and we actually track the number of hours that they dedicate to community service. So what were our results? Well, um, we evaluate our employee engagement through Gallup. And on Gallup's Q12, the first time um, we uh, got, got the baseline, but by the second round on the Q12, we had improved in every single category uh, of the 12 questions. And later, um, we did it at the uh, baseline, the two-year and the four-year point. After four years, we had gone from, I believe it was in the 20s percentile-wise of all all others in the Gallup survey um, to the 80s. So um, very, very significant progress with employee engagement. Service, the, um, one of the indicators we used was HAP in its annual member satisfaction survey. And it is now six consecutive years that they've gotten the JD Powers Award for member satisfaction. So um, very, very impressive. Quality, I mentioned earlier that harm rate that we had de designed. And our harm rate, we were able to reduce harm 24% in three years as compared to the next organization that, was, um, that we were benchmarking, which was 6%. Uh, during this time, when we were building the new hospital in West Bloomfield, we were uh, acquiring two other hospitals that came on board in 2007 we were hitting the worst economic time since the Depression, and Michigan was hit earlier than most and harder than most. Um, and so we take a, a lot of pride in telling the story um, through our Baldridge application of doubling our revenue, increasing market share, and uh, becoming really financially stable during this difficult time. Um, the market share growth from 11 to 18% when we had droves of people leaving Michigan during this time was something we were really um, pleased with. Uh, revenue growth, uh, assets, um, all of this was, was um, during this very difficult time and, and when we had the high, one of the highest bankruptcy rates for, for homes and businesses, um, we were still getting A stable and A1 stable from the rating agencies. Philanthropy has played a key role, and um, I, I, I feel that that um, w would also be a turning point for us in terms of getting people to have confidence in our organization. When you're losing $100 million back in 2000, people don't have a lot of confidence in your organization, so it really took a lot um, uh, to uh, get people to believe in us again. Cash donations improved from nine million annually to 30 million. And one of the things we did was we really got our employees to be involved. And I, I give the head of philanthropy huge credit because he developed what he called community giving ambassadors throughout the health system. And these ambassadors um, were, in, were embedded in, in departments and helped raise a whole lot of money. We now are exceeding $3 million given every year by our own employees and physicians. Three million. We have tried to benchmark this. We believe that um, it surpasses any other program, uh, healthcare program, in the U.S. Um, we also started a uh, capital campaign, and during that time, uh, it's a, it was a seven-year campaign to end in 2014. We will actually reach the 250 million mark this year, so we will have reached it a year early. So very key to um, sustainability and being able to do some of those growth initiatives that otherwise wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be on the table. A lessons learned. Um, I, I'm not gonna be able to emphasize enough how much um, this has to be led by and driven by the CEO. The commitment really has to be there. Because I'm telling you, there were many of us who would have done it um, you know, the first year and then wanted to take a break for two or three years as we improved. She kept out there front and center saying, we need to do this. This is aggressive, but I know you can do it. Giving us the confidence. Um, pouring over the um, uh, OFIs with us, the reports, and, and uh, playing a critical 
critical role. Um, you know, no, she did not do the writing, but she set the tone for what she thought the stories should be that we were telling, and uh, and read every one of the applications and gave her input and her feedback. Um, but really, it was it was driven by her and had to be driven by her because we would have not ended up where we were without uh, without her leadership. And, and then leaders as champions and co-leads. I want to emphasize this as well. I was I was co-leader for category three for a few years, um, and then they, I was really mad, but then they, <laughs> they switched me to category one, and I was getting so good at category three. Um, but they, ne they needed different people doing different things, and um, at one point I turned to the consultant, because I was spending so much time doing this, and I said, I'm spending a lot of time writing. I said, D -d -d you can't tell me that, er that executives and senior leaders are writing these applications everywhere. And she said, oh, yes, they are. And, um, and, you know, and then finally I got, I got it. I got how much I was learning and how much I was improving by doing the writing. So if you, if you get nervous by that when you're first entering and saying, I can't be spending my time doing this, it really is, um, it, it, if you integrate it into your work, going to be um, a driver of that improvement versus another thing on your list. Um, building the competency levels of your team. I was really impressed at, uh, at the table I was sitting at because um, one of the health systems said that they had up to 30 people um, who at one time were uh, examiners. Having people as examiners really improves and enriches your understanding of the framework and how to improve. We have on here, it's okay to use the B word, and the reason we weren't using the Baldridge word a lot in our organization is we really felt that people might think it was a um, initiative, you know, they're gonna do this and if I lay low long enough, they'll do something else and I won't ever have to get to know the Baldridge stuff. Um, so we weren't using the B word a lot, but then when we were getting examined um, and having a site visit, and people were going to inter be introducing themselves as Baldridge examiners, that sort of put us behind the eight ball. I don't recommend you not using the, the Baldridge word. Um, we really had to bring our employees up to speed and say, you know how you've been doing action plans based upon the strategic initiatives, based upon the strategic objectives? That's the Baldridge framework. <laughs> and so if you get asked about it, you know, that's what this is. And so um, uh, it is okay to use it and to be comfortable with it. And of course, winning doesn't mean perfection. We are so far from perfect. But it, it means that you're getting better at seeking perfection and that you're getting better at utilizing um, uh, your analysis to improve. And uh, we really feel that way. And I had to put in there, um, is it an award or strategy? Because you know some people said, oh, this is just something Nancy wants to receive this award. Um, but if you want to be really honest, it's an award and a strategy. Because um, all, all along, we were doing this to become uh, an excellent organization, to perform better. But boy, it, it was really nice to be able to say we received the award as well. Um, the journey continues, and I, I have to say, um, that we're working on all of the things that we need to work on. Um, one of the things that I loved, one of the examiners, she said, you know, you, you guys say that you do really tight planning at the front end, and then because you're very large, you, you're a little looser and let the business units um, uh, execute, and then you become really tight on the um, measuring part. And she said, in some cases, I noticed it was tight, loose, loose. So we're, we're working on those um, you know, areas where we feel we need to um, be better at measuring and better at, at, at changing the path if we're not doing well. But the real um, journey is gonna continue once we are closed with our merger. On October 31st of last year, we announced that our very large, complex health system had signed a letter of intent to merge with another large, complex health system. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Beaumont. Uh, Beaumont's uh, based in Royal Oak, Michigan. It's a suburb of Detroit. They're a $2.5 billion organization, very widely respected. 
Um, we came together and are in the middle of due diligence. We are hoping to have a definitive agreement by May and then go through all of the uh, regulatory approvals. We have targeted end of summer for a close date. So those, those in the organization and Henry Ford who are, who are real disciples of Baldridge, who've been involved in the process from day one said, so is Beaumont going to be adopting the Baldridge framework and are we going to be able to get our hands in there? And I'm almost sure the answer is yes, we will. But it will be a whole new journey for us um, because it's a very different system and um, uh, we will want to use that same platform, I'm confident, and because we've, we've seen so much improvement. So it's a very exciting time for us um, and we, uh, we are um, uh, really believing that the merger is just one little step. It's going to be about um, adopting all of those um, performance excellence indicators we've worked on all along that will get us to the point where we want to be and where others may want to partner with us. So i um, very, very excited about that new venture. I am, um, before opening up for questions, we like to say that um, our employees tell our story better than any of us. So for the site visit, rather than um, only at the opening session having the CEO speak or a few leaders speak, we let our employees speak by um, creating a video that talked about what they, um, what they do to improve each and every day. And I wanted to share that with you. I'm Dr. Taft Parsons III. I'm the medical director and hospital director of Kingswood Hospital. Over a decade ago, we saw that there were many suicides as killers in our community. At that point, we started the Perfect Depression Care Program. I'm proud to be part of an organization that has worked for and achieved zero suicides. I work in the outpatient hemodialysis unit and I was involved in a team uh, that worked on a project using antibiotic lock to prevent infections in dialysis patients. My name is Carol Moore. I work at Henry Ford Hospital in dialysis and I'm proud to work at a place that strives for innovation. Hi, my name is Kyla Page. I work at Henry Ford Wyandotte Hospital. We improve the quality of room service by making sure everyone has fresh fruit daily and that everyone is enjoying their customer experience. Um, it's a whole new system. They take patients' call down to place their order. They can look through the menu and we just make sure that they get it within 45 minutes. I'm proud to work for Henry Ford Health System where every patient is treated like our treasured guest. I'm the Culinary Wellness Director at Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital and run the demonstration kitchen at West Bloomfield. We do uh, classes that are disease specific behind people's certain eating needs, uh, whether it be diabetic or celiac, uh, uh, heart smart type menus, uh, Weight Watchers. When we bring in customers from outside, we put a fork in their mouth and get them to feel and believe that, gosh, I can do this. I'm Chef Frank Turner, and I'm helping saving lives one meal at a time. I work in the medical ICU downtown, and we work on safety every day. Uh, everything we do is geared towards patient safety and improving outcomes. One particular thing we're proud of is our stuff that we've done with ventilator-associated pneumonia. Everything we really do every day kind of gears towards that. Uh, things from intermittent sedation as opposed to continuous IV sedation, all the way to our really cool mobility program that we've started in January that hopefully is going to change the face of ICUs across the country. My name is Stephanie Schultz. I work in the medical ICU at Henry Ford downtown and every day I work hard to do no harm. I took advantage of the Live Midtown incentive because it offered me a chance to work, live, and play in my own backyard. It was an incentive offered through Henry Ford Health System. My name is Jamar Williams. I work for Health Alliance Plan, and thanks to the Live Midtown Incentive Program, I can walk to work. I'm the Director of Faith and Community Health for Henry Ford Macomb Hospitals. Our purpose is to help those who are uninsured, those who don't have access to health care, to gain what they need so that they can be healthy, contributing parts of our community. We've been helping to form what is Faith Community Nursing and the model of free clinics that we have all over this nation. My name is Imelda Brown. I work with the Neighbors Caring for Neighbors Clinic and we're improving healthcare across the entire country.
I'm a family practice doctor and I was involved in the project with the Henry Ford Medical Group and Health Alliance Plan's efforts to bring electronic prescribing to Henry Ford Health System. I'm David Allard and I'm proud to be part of the e-prescribing program at the Henry Ford Health System. I work at Henry Ford Home Healthcare, the telehealth section. We manage patients with specific disease processes, congestive heart failure, COPD, diabetes, and severe hypertension. Monitoring these patients in their home, utilizing a, a telehealth station. Every time the patient checks their blood pressure, um, their pulse oximetry, or um, steps on the scale, it transmits that information to us at Henry Ford Home Healthcare. My name is Jesse Cruz and I'm proud to be a member of the Henry Ford Telehealth Program, improving patients' lives in their homes. The, you know, once, once Nancy set the stage for Baldridge being um, the platform we were going to use to achieve excellence across all of our pillars, the senior leaders all had to step up and really um, participate actively in one of the categories. It wasn't, you know, it was, yes, that's what we're going to do. And that really helped. I, when I was head of category three, Category three is the customer. And if I don't truly understand um, where my gaps are and how to improve and um, how to better engage the customer, I'm not doing my job. So category three, um, aligning, aligning the categories with the people who should be the experts and, and really can help improve what they do every day is a critical way to do that. Eventually, I, I went to category one because they didn't have a person doing leadership, um, that, that person left the organization. And so um, that was really a great learning for me. So it was outside my comfort uh, level, but I learned a whole new piece that I think just made me uh, you know, a, better, a better leader in general. Um, but I think matching them up, um, and we not only had what I call subject matter experts or leaders being the co-chairs, but we then had executive champions as well because we had to figure out how to involve the CEOs of the business units. Most of the co-leaders were people that were um, executive v or uh, senior VPs or VPs of the area, so strategic planning. Co-chair was the VP of strategic planning. But how do you involve the CEO of Wyandotte Hospital or the CEO of West Bloomfield? They became champions. And so you met with your champion on a regular basis. You really have to figure out how to engage them and how to show them that what you're doing is helping further uh, their goals and their progress. Thank you. Yes. what the impact was and that they understood what you were trying to accomplish and how did you, how were you able to measure that? Well, I'm my, not that I'm promoting my breakout session this afternoon, but that's really the topic <laughs> of my breakout session. No, I, I, I could address that. We have, really, we have really found that the traditional way of communicating at uh, employees um, it isn't very effective. So it's involving them. So almost every key initiative has what we call champions. I mentioned the community giving campaign, having a champion embedded in every department throughout the entire system. We do the same thing with uh, quality. We have safety champions that are embedded everywhere. We have service champions. I'm in charge of customer engagement or service. So I have service champions embedded in every department. And then when I wanted when, when we took on the task of training all of our employees this year, 
um, all 23, it was last year, excuse me, we decided to train all 23,000 employees in a certain service uh, methodology. It's, it's a, it's a, um, a well-known uh, studer uh, mechanism of using AIDET, A-I-D-E-T. We, the way we did it is we trained the trainer and we had 150 people in the organization, not just leaders, who then helped us train the employees. It's involving. And I'm actually gonna be, um, uh, talking more about that this afternoon and how to involve, but the metric, and this is really important, we used to define our metrics in the communications field as how many people were um, uh, reading our publications or how many people were, um, you know, um, understanding what we wrote. Now we do it with the initiative. So real quick example, one of our initiatives was um, health engagement. We wanted 70, I think the goal was 75% um, of our employees the first year that we offered health engagement to participate. Health engagement is where the, um, you will get lower health insurance um, rates if you and your uh, spouse take a physical and fill out a health risk appraisal form. So communication was critical to that. So I now, to measure, we now partner with whoever is leading that initiative. In this case, it was human resources. And we see if we're able to accomplish the goal. In that case, it was 75% and we achieved 80% that first year. And so um, I, I have really changed how we measure communication. And it is, are you accomplishing the initiative in partnership with whoever is driving that initiative? So. I hope, was that helpful? Yes. Other questions? Yes. One more? Okay, I'm getting the okay, one more. <laughs> Since nobody else is asking, are you using the Baldridge criteria in any way in your due diligence to accomplish the merger? Well, <laughs> I think in some respects we are. It is so early on though, that right now it's a lot of the work is being done by attorneys and um, our consultants. A lot of what happens with our merger is there's information we have and there's information Bowman has and only certain outside people can look at them together because of all the restrictions on competitor, um, sharing of competitor data. So I don't, I can't say that we're doing anything um, uh, really closely related to Baldridge at this time, but um, we see that as the way to really integrate the two organizations, and this isn't going to just be a holding company where one acquired the other. This is truly a merger, and we're forming a new company, and so we see that framework being critical to forming the new company. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.